this by bike. Uh, so um, uh, let's uh, start with a uh, video. A what? A video. <laughs> yes, that's my move. Yeah. This day have set upon a mighty endeavor. Souls will be shaken with the violences of war in this hour of great sacrifice. We shall prevail. Get your head down and keep moving! We are all that separates the world from darkness. The enemy is ruthless. We cannot. We must not fail. Duty first. There is! Won't be enough for you! Casualties. We executed the mission. Get me the fuck out of here. How many? We had orders! Get the cover! Lieutenant, tell them what we're all about. No mission too difficult. No sacrifice too great. Welcome to the bloody first. You're a long way from Texas for him, boy. You had to get in the mood for this talk. Right? Yeah, thanks for the plug. So, uh, Something light. You guys fired up? Something yeah. light, neat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, how long have you two been working together? And uh, how far back does that go? Oh, man, like. A hundred years. Oh, it's too long. <laughs> it's over a decade. Uh -huh. More like 12, 13, 14 years, something like that. So here's a trick question then. Which one is the creative one and which one is the business <laughs> guy? Well, we don't work that way. I'm, I'm uh, he sledge, I'm hammer. <laughs> Look, we're both, we're both creative. I, I, uh, uh, we, we talk about that a lot, right? Um, I definitely lean more towards that, and he leans more towards making sure that we get stuff done and the business running and all that. But mm -hmm. these days, we're on all all the modes as uh, pretty much the creative leads, directors of the game. It's sort of like uh, just asking which one's the extrovert and which one's the introvert, right? <laughs> A little bit of both in each of you, maybe? We are different, that's for sure. Yeah, that's for sure. I don't know either one of us would be described as introverts necessarily, <laughs> but. You know, I, I value my partnership with Glenn because um, he certainly can see further sometimes creatively. Um, often that comes off as crazy and um, ungrounded, but it pushes me. So, you know, I think we found complementary skills at times, and sometimes yeah. in the studio it makes us sound like we're an old married couple squabbling, but... Um, I mean, I'll spend more time in the art part as well, you know, mm -hmm. but... Uh, uh, that's just more of my strength. Mm -hmm. He'll spend a lot of time in MP and all. So how do you start your creative process? Getting started on a new game. Um, we're very efficient with uh, uh, pre-production nowadays. We have a team of uh, senior people that we've been working with quite a long time. We don't waste any time in pre-production. Mm -hmm. uh, a game like we're working on right now did take about a month of getting in there and really studying World War II to pick out the part that we wanted to do that made sense for us. Um, I would say that each game, there's, there's a, a real research time up front, and then we just dive into pre-production drawings and sketches and all kinds of stuff like that. It's, it's kind of a broad question, though. I mean, yeah, broad. you know, we both worked on licensed games, Glenn on Lord of the Rings, I worked on Bond for years. We worked on new IP, Dead Space. Now we're working on Call of Duty. And so each one of those, I think, starts from a different creative process, yes, yes. Um, a sort of center of passion mm -hmm. that the team has to embrace. And it starts with having a, um, an early vision. So I think each one of those, you know, the, the genesis of each one of those is probably a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like this creative, the one on, on, that we're doing right now for uh, World War II, um, 
people, you know, people said, well, that's not much, you just worked on advanced warfare. And I'm like, it, it, creatively, it couldn't be more different. One was studying the future and, come, and using things that may happen and, and, and trying to figure out what's gonna happen. This other one is a deep, deep dive into what did happen. Mm -hmm. So creatively, it's been a nice, uh, nice change, each one. You know, modern we did, then we did uh, advanced, and now we're doing the past. So it's been good for us that way. What if, what if you get into a situation where half the studio wants to do World War II and half wants to do advanced warfare too? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and Sledgehammer Games, we believe in, you know, developers have to have passion for what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And so you want them to be invested in, in the vision and the game itself to get the best out of them. And so for Sledgehammer, we, we've adopted a practice since the beginning. Um, oh, was that me? Sorry, Dean. Forget it later. <laughs> um, where we actually will talk to the studio. Every game we worked on in Call of Duty for Activision, we've taken it to a team vote. Yep. And you don't always get a majority sort of vote the first mm -hmm. time. And so you talk through the, the issues and you talk through the opportunities and you, and you address questions. And, you know, it happened, as many of you probably know, when we started Call of Duty um, eight years ago, we weren't on Modern Warfare 3. We were on a different game they brought us in to do. And so we had to take a vote then. And then we talked about advanced warfare. And even on this one, you know, as, as you can probably imagine, mm -hmm. you know, having just shipped advanced warfare, which... Um, nominated for Action Game of the Year, and we were really proud of that game, and, and did we want to do a sequel to that, or did we want to come back to um, returning to the roots of the franchise, and, and we wanted it to be a, a studio decision. Mm -hmm. If the two of us are aligned on something, we can be really passionate. I mean, that means we're passionate about it, and that passion kind of uh, will get to the studio, mm -hmm. and it's really important that they see that we're really behind the idea. Um, so, um, you know, some of the other earlier speakers, um, you know, dealt with questions like, is Hollywood creative or do we have Hollywood envy? Um, uh, in your case, I guess some people might uh, just sort of feel like Call of Duty can't be creative because it's, uh, it's Call of Duty number 15 or whatever. It's yeah. like Final Fantasy 15. It's like, you know, how do you sort of counter that sort of thinking, I guess? That, uh, uh, well, Speaking for myself, uh, I'm, a, I, you know, my, I'm an artist, so my whole life, that's what I do. It's, it's, you know, I paint, I draw, I got paint on my hands now. Um, this is art that we do. And we had to study and we had to uh, create things and, and um, build, you know, come up with the world and come up with the story. We don't, the, the story of the characters is, is ours, right? The story of what, um, what happened in the war is really the backdrop. Mm -hmm. um, creatively, I mean, that's like, you know, saying to Spielberg that Private Ryan wasn't a creative project because it's the war. But, um, yeah, we left Dead Space, which, you know, people would say it's high up there as a creative one, mm -hmm. to come here um, and work on Call of Duty. It is not only intensely creative. I'll put it to you this way. You have to come up with a million ideas, right? So a game, everybody knows, a game has, I don't know, uh, a thousand ideas. Uh, the idea is like, oh, I'm gonna be in a castle. Okay, cool. Then you have a hundred thousand creative decisions, right? Oh, the castle's gonna be in, in a location, it's gotta be this color. And we have to make those decisions all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's a really big creative endeavor for me. Yeah, I, I wouldn't agree with with the sentiment that it's not creative mm -hmm. at all. I mean, I think for us, for me, I don't mean to speak for Glenn, but I'm sure you share this. You know, I, I look at franchises that are beloved throughout time, right? And you look at the Batman franchise or the Star Wars franchise or the James Bond franchise, and there's been these inflection points where new creative visions have come in and been able to de deliver that to fans um, in really powerful ways, mm -hmm. right? The Dark Knight, what a great, moment in Batman history. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, three years is a lot of time to devote to anything. Mm -hmm. And nobody wants to put three years of their life on hold for a game that's not creative or not original. And so for us, knowing that there was a, a really robust fan base mm -hmm. and a really powerful partner in Activision who would support us and provide the opportunities, and then allowing us to put the sledgehammer stamp on it, 
like Glenn That's said. That's the key. The, the sledgehammer stamp is, is our, our way of, of, you know, adding our creative part, which, you know, some would say this, you know, some of the over the top of the action that we do and big set pieces and stuff like that. And those are so much fun to work on, you know. Mm -hmm. So you guys uh, went out to Europe and uh, you took a lot of your people with you. You looked at old battle, battlegrounds and, and World War II. I, I was in Berlin at the same time as you guys were and you, you just toured the Reichstag as well, I think. Yes. So, um, uh, wh why is that ne you know, a necessary part of the creative process? I mean, we were big proponents of actual on-site research wherever possible. And I, you know, I remember reading about the Pixar process I'm a big fan of Pixar, and for obvious reasons, I'm sure people in this room are as well. And they just talked about, you know, the, the neuroscience of pattern matching, right? Of having your brain tell you what something is supposed to look like before, because of what you're used to, before you actually have internalized the pieces, right? And, and I remember this particular example where they talked about, you know, if you were to draw a picture of um, like a, a field of grass, right? Mm -hmm. Your brain automatically is gonna go to green. But then they go like, well, but if you take and you look through grass in like a pinhole, right, you're gonna see maybe some dirt, maybe some weeds, maybe it's brown grass, I don't know. There's gonna be something in that pinhole before your pattern matching process catches up, right? And I think for us and for me in particular, getting out on site in these research locations, whether it's Call of Duty World War II or, or whatever you know, the community is working on, it puts you on the ground through the pinhole. Right, which is very different, I think, than trying to watch somebody else's interpretation of a film or Googling images on Google, mm -hmm. right? Like being there, you get to see the detail that your brain hasn't um, been informed of through somebody else's interpretation. And so yeah, we, we traveled the globe from, from Normandy to the Rhine and from Gibraltar to, to the Rhine stuff. It was pretty awesome. I can't believe you went with like the neuroscience view of that. <laughs> <laughs> Too big of a word? Well, kind of. You know, I was just thinking, I like to climb the trees when we get out there and slide down the... You did climb a tree. Yeah. I don't know how that helped us, but he did. I mean, you know... Uh, <laughs> he did climb a tree. <laughs> I don't Like either. a giant polar bear. Yeah, panda. <laughs> Little tiny tree. Um, you know what? It was, it was, in some parts, we had three feet of snow. And it was 10 below zero. And there was blizzard conditions. It was just like um, some of the, that, that they fought. Mm -hmm. And so being out there and seeing your breath and feeling with the cold and, and, and knowing how much you had to um, you know, bundle up. And, and, and then we were actually in their foxholes. You know, they're still there. Mm -hmm. um, there's you know, people, we, you were talking about uh, neuroscience and pinholes. Um, <laughs> one thing, you know, we make snow. And it you know, looks nice, and we go and we spend all this time on shaders and everything, but when you go, go there, there's pine, pine needles all over the snow. Like, stuff like that, and you just want to get it right. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the, the details are important, and but the also scale. the feeling. Man, the scale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, like you can never really truly capture the scale of things, right? Mm -hmm. um, not to be overly uh, now, World War II, but, you know, I mean, we stood in craters that were 15 feet wide that yeah. were, that were there since 1944, and you just wouldn't, you wouldn't pick up on that level of detail, right? You wouldn't get the pinhole version of what really happened if you weren't there. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, Call of Duty World at War came out in 2008. Um, uh, what, what can you do now that you couldn't have done, say, in 2009 with the Call of Duty World War II game? It, it is, a lot of it is in the detail. Mm -hmm. um, and, so the way I'm, I'm looking at uh, environments right now is uh, we're sort of in the uncanny valley of them, right? Everything, it's starting to look really good, but there's little things that are off, right? And, and um, it's time to get really into the details of, of the world, where the, the edges come together, um, where grass just not it, it actually is in the, in the uh, dirt, right? Um, we, get, we get a lot of that. We can get the facial structure. We can get the, the you know, them really, really talking and working together. And, um, is that my mom? <laughs> I told her. Um, 
you get the atmosphere, the tone, the mood, uh, emotion really can be displayed a lot better now, you know, with the, the sweat and everything. And it's still not powerful enough. We still drive those things down. Like, mm -hmm. And do you like to call that kind of moment, uh, I don't know, cinematic, uh, the way, you know, a lot of people sort of compliment games on? Uh, you know, when they say a game is good, they say it's cinematic. Um, See, cinematic, we, we definitely think uh, cinematically a lot, mm -hmm. yes, you know, uh, when any time we have a place that we can kind of show off a background or anything like that, we'll take the time to frame it right or, or make sure that we're framing, you know, the first time you see a tank or something like that, frame it right, get it right, you know, we're, we're definitely artists thinking about, un, you know, uh, um, unfortunate tangents and, and, you know, colors not, not working together right, so, um, I, mean, I think cinematic is probably one word, but yeah. I think we talk about immersive and, and right. um, unfortunate tangents and, and you know colors not not working together right. So, um, I, mean, I think cinematic is probably one word, but yeah, I, I think we talk about immersive and anytime a game breaks immersion, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's rendering, mm -hmm. right? Something that you see that you don't believe because it's animation the, nowadays, right? It could be size of crowds, it could be. Um, the, you know, the, the, the way the physics interacts with the world, right? Anytime you break immersion, um, the player disconnects from the narrative and the experience that you're trying um, to keep them immersed in. And so these, the latest generation of hardware is clearly the most powerful we've ever had. And um, it just continues to allow us to keep players more and more immersed. So you did all this research and you waited this long to revisit World War II, uh, but you also got something a little different that I didn't expect out of it, which is um, more diversity, right? How did, how did that happen? <laughs> yeah, that's a great one. Um, you know, I think there's two answers. One, we'll talk about the game, and then I think maybe one we can talk about sort of our value set as the studio and as, as um, creators of um, entertainment. So I'll, I'll talk about the creators of entertainment angle. Maybe you can talk about the creative of the game. Um, we've talked about this before, right? Um, and I think I've talked about it at length. Like we know for a fact that there are half of all gamers on the planet now are female, right? We know that um, creative companies are, are more timely, more profitable, more innovative when they have large diversity. Um, and that just comes down to the fact that you have a broader sense of ideas and perspectives on any yes. given topic, right? And that allows you to have more interesting dialogue and it allows you to have um, a more broadly appealing set of um, things that you can represent in your game. And so for us, it, as Sledgehammer Games, Glenn and I made a commitment years ago that we wanted to, one, sort of have Sledgehammer help the industry progress and move forward in a place better than when we entered it two decades ago. And two, we want more gamers to feel like they have heroes and, um, and things they can relate to. And so it's always been important to Sledgehammer Games that we represent diversity in our games and we represent diversity in our studio um, population. It was a world war. Mm -hmm. Every country, almost every country, every person at that time was touched by it, whether you're black, white, brown, whatever, whether you're man or woman. And in, in researching, right, there wasn't any group that was spared in a way. And, um, you know, so in Paris, you have the French resistance, right? And a lot of them were made up of, uh, of women. And in, in Poland, you have the same way. And in, in America, even, you know, we had, it was a segregated army, but the African-American uh, troops were indispensable. Right, and so they. The part of the story is that we, you know, they cross paths, and and we work together, and that's the way it was. Now we don't hide um, the racism. We don't shy away from it. We don't shy away from uh, the fact that one of the um, uh, one of the, the the guys in the platoon is uh, is Jewish. Right, that's that's brought up a lot because that's that's what what was being talked about at the time. So we don't shy away from it, and we just try and tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, sort of retell an experience that uh, I guess uh, people may have uh, forgotten about or just not heard about anymore from Yeah, that's right. That we, it. Yeah, thank you. I didn't mean to cut you off there, Dean. I, I think mm -hmm. for us, 
Um, when we first started on this journey two and a half years ago, having the opportunity to return Call of Duty to, to its roots was just an opportunity the studio didn't want to pass up on, and we were very passionate about it. But I remember this emotional journey that, that I went on, I think Glenn did too, where, you know, it's been 70 plus years, right? And so we have a world-renowned military historian who also was the military historian on Band of Brothers and worked with um, Ambrose at the World War II His History Museum. And he was talking about 10 years ago, all the heroes, they don't call themselves heroes, but they were heroes. Um, they were alive and they could be interviewed. And, and so we started this journey saying, hey, look, it, we want to tell this story because we can't let it drift from memory because we can't let it, let, ever let it happen again. Um, but as we got to get deeper into the research, we also realized that we, we have to tell it because the people who were there fighting for our freedom um, are no longer here to tell it for themselves. Like that whole crew is no longer around. And so, you know, Glenn and I talk a lot about, and the studio talks a lot about respect and honor and camaraderie and all of these really powerful emotional terms that are true. But more than anything, I think it's because these common men and women who did these uncommon things, um, they can't tell them stories for themselves. And I think that's really, probably makes this personal. the most personal story we've ever met, yeah. worked on. It's, it's really, really personal um, for most of us on the team. Uh, you know, I've said this before, my grandfather was in the war, he actually lost his leg. He got a, um, a purple heart and a, um, a, sil a gold star. And um, we have them hanging up and, uh, and my dad would tell the stories. He would tell me some stories because my grandfather wouldn't say too much. Uh, and then my dad died during the making of this game, so we named the main character after my dad. And, um, and it, it, it goes more, more, more personal than that. I think that in the end, we've all gotten respect from talking to these people and uh, listening to their stories that, yeah, we're trying to get everything right. I, respect is, is, is such a good word for it. Um, for the game that we're making, that we didn't, you know, we had a respect for, of course, the game that we made before, but there's a different kind of thing here. So it's really happened. Like uh, custodians or caretakers that sometimes. Yeah, you know, it, just the way Private Ryan has been the, the that's a the good word, custodian for the last 19 years of, of that look. When people talk about uh, D Day or anything, they, they, most people will reference that. And we want, 20 years later, we'd like people to start, you know, this generation to reference us. And so, um, you know, wow, did you see D-Day? So we need to come at it from a different angle as well, um, and you can. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>